I am brought to you here with the Horror Rev, and this is his third guest appearance here and what I am using the working title of as the unholy trilogy of meetings. Um, and that is a term of endearment for certain because the horror rev is very, very knowledgeable in all things horror and has a website called the horror revolution, which I encourage each and every single one of you guys to check out because it is a super cool website everything horror and if you are a horror fan you owe it to yourself to go check it out rev what uh what are some of the most recent stuff you reviewed i know i saw i think deep red was on there and then maybe blood and black lace as well yeah um i did those uh in kind of a preparation for having the last episode with you um and i was like damn these are good i'm gonna have to put these on the website um and I also just recently did a July 4th special thing with, uh, I did Return of the Living Dead and Jaws and uh, Uncle Sam. And I know what you did last summer, kind of four July 4th holiday movies. Um, try to do that around the holidays, kind of come up with like little theme lists. Uh, coming soon, I've got like an animal week with like grizzly and uh, alligator and a whole bunch of other shit coming up. So it's going to be a lot of fun. That sounds awesome. And, I, you know, I think everyone can really get behind themes, especially each holiday. Uh, what is the, the hardest holiday to kind of try to build a theme around? I'm assuming Arbor Day is probably one of the Arbor more difficult. Arbor Day. <laughs> Flag Day, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Boxing Day. I don't know. One thing I saw, um, and I think it was the, the Uncle Sam one, What did you get the inspiration um was it Joe Bob Briggs that like recommended it on his drive-in uh, show? I have not watched his show yet, but I think people had said that he recommended it. Yeah, I think they did it on last drive-in. Um, I actually had it set up like a month ago, so I didn't know they were going to do that uh, when I did it. Uh, might bring a few more views maybe, which wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, man, I, I'm a huge fan of Joe Bob Briggs. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I definitely recommend it. I've been watching him since I was probably 12 years old. Um, he used to have the old Monster Vision on TNT, and he's just hilarious and amazing. And he is somebody that I would love to sit and pick his brain because he probably knows more about horror movies than anybody else in the world. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I just got the Shudder uh, subscription, so – that is probably one I'm going to be checking out soon. Also, I think it is called Mad God, and that is getting absolutely rave reviews. Have you gotten the opportunity to check that one out yet? I did, yeah. I reviewed that one as well, um, actually, the day it came out on Shudder. Um, it's pretty crazy. It's definitely it's a movie with like no plot, really. Mm. But it's it's uh, made by a guy named Phil Tippett who did the dinosaur uh, anime. Well, he did the stop motion dinosaur animations for Jurassic Park. He did um, the ED two hundred nine, I think it's called, and RoboCop. I mean, the dude like created my childhood. <laughs> and I figured the least I could do was watch this movie and and give it a shot. So I mean, it's definitely not one if you're looking for movies with strict plots. But he is the best that ever did what he does. Jumping from that to uh, our theme for this week, obviously it is all things kaiju, and we have one of the king kaijus himself, Gamera or Gamera, uh, tomato tomato. But this is one of the top, you know, trilogies or films with miniatures, and uh, I think definitely lacing up the the old bodysuit being Gamera having someone physically act out the movies I mean uh, what were some of the highlights for you for this series as a whole yeah I mean I'm a huge fan of the kaiju movies uh, they're all a lot of fun and and definitely between the wearing a, a monster suit thing of the old kaijus to some of the you know some of the CGI that you get into in some of the series 
it's all done pretty well. Um, it's decent stories, coherent stories. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's actually a lot better than I expected it to be. I was not looking forward to it when you initially proposed it. And I was like, <laughs> really, we're going to have to watch this shit. But no, it was super entertaining. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I think I was a bit surprised too. Um, and, and we were talking about this on our, our first recording and I guess kind of our kaiju introductions and um, was Godzilla your first introduction or is that the, the biggest one that you remember as an introduction that made you want to watch more of these kind of Japanese big monster movies? I'm sure it was. I mean, I was a huge fan of all of the kaiju stuff when I was a kid, you know, from uh, probably eight, nine years old, something like that. It's one of my first introductions to horror as well, just because it's so kid friendly. Some of the older movies, they're not really scary. They're a little playful and, you know, kind of dumb looking, honestly, when you get into like Godzilla's son or whatever it's called Godzilla junior, I think. But, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of great movies to watch. Um, it's something you can introduce your kids to. So it's a great kind of bridge especially if you can find the dubbed ones so they don't have to read subtitles or whatever. But yeah, I mean, the kaiju movies are a lot of fun. Godzilla is absolutely the first step, but Gamera is a nice little addition to the to the whole pantheon of kaiju characters. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, I, I believe on YouTube and I did watch the second one and I, I don't know whether it was an error on my part, but I, I couldn't find it on any of the streaming services I had. So I watched the second one on YouTube. I believe all three are on YouTube from the same channel. And I think they are all dubbed and just going deeper into the point that you said, as far as this being a really kind of good family movie, this even all the way through. And, and we had said it kind of gets, you know, more horror at, uh, kind of elements as the series progresses, but it's still, I don't think it's ever too much even for, you know, younger children. Um, even the third one, which it pushes the boundaries a little bit more and it might actually scare your kids. I don't think it's ever too much on the horror spectrum. No, and you know, it really kind of depends on how you view horror. I mean, there's nothing scarier in there than the shit you saw in Gremlins. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, I think we had talked about it before. You know, there's a lot of complaints online about when Doctor Strange came out about how, oh, PG-13 movies shouldn't be scary and all this. I'm like, Gremlins was PG. Are you crazy? That movie was scary as shit. Go watch that <laughs> shit, like now, as a 20, 30-something, 40-year-old. Go watch that movie and tell me that isn't really damn scary for like a 10 year old. Yeah. So, I mean, there's nothing in these films that are nearly as scary as some of the shit in that movie. Yeah. And it's really cool how it kind of ramps up. And I think as more horror elements are introduced, so too does the quality of the movies and not like super intensely. I think this whole trilogy is very solid, uh, starting with Gamera, Guardian of the Universe. This is Shisuke Kinako all the way through. He directs all three movies, and our starting point is in 1995. In this one, we have Gamera, our introduction, uh, you know, a deep in the sea. They call it an atoll, and then we have a Gaius. I believe would be that's the best pronunciation you're going to get out of me uh, come from space to earth. And there's kind of multiple and, and guy who's they, they kind of almost look like aliens mixed with dinosaur. I mean, and that's, that's kind of a big template I think they use and they have these triangular, really hard heads and they battle across you know, these, I don't think in Japan, but in a city or not Japan, I meant not in Tokyo, but in a city um, and carnage ensues. And this is, you know, a really good solid start to the series, I would say. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and that is a good description. It's kind of like an alien pterodactyl. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and they make that kind of sound and they all kind of scream. I mean, you know, not that we know what a pterodactyl sounds like, but they make what you would imagine a pterodactyl would sound like. Um, you know, and there there are so many things in this that are dinosaur related. You know, you kind of feel like, and I know we talked about it before, and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit here. The first film is really, in my opinion, kind of modeled after Jurassic Park, which came out a year earlier in 94. There's so many scenes that are fairly paralleled with at least the first Jurassic Park, you know, but I think they kind of took a lot of inspirations from it. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it builds pretty well off of the successes of its predecessors. Um, I mean, it's, it's very close to kind of some of the Godzilla movies of the sixties and seventies too. But what I think it does offer that is a step up, at least from Godzilla is that I found the kind of final battle to be much more of a a good climax to a movie like this, where a lot of things are built up like the, these kind of human connections to Gamera and they go through a lot of the themes. And how did you kind of feel about the thematic in, you know, human nature or human elements to this one? Well, it was really kind of cool having like the psychic link between Gamera and the girl with the little necklace that she found. Um, you know, when Gamera gets slashed with one of the creatures, she has blood on her. And, you know, it kind of brings a little bit of human element into what's otherwise like this big monster battle. Um, and I agree with you. I, I think that the end of the film certainly feels a lot more, a lot more, I guess less Mary Sue, I guess you could say than like the Godzilla movies often are, Um, you know, and a lot of times those movies, he will be in dire straits and he will all of a sudden have this brand new ability that he hasn't had in any other movie that they've released. (laughs) And and it wasn't really like that in this, this was kind of, it was a lot more straightforward and like, you know, of course, you know, he's going to win, but he wins in a way that doesn't feel contrived. Yeah. And, and we get introduced to, you know, his kind of powers in a really cool way. Uh, We had kind of brought up the way that Gamera can fly, which is very unique. It kind of uses the arm and leg holes of this shell and then kind of propels out of it. It's almost like they become blasters uh, to let it fly, almost like, uh, like a turtle esque ufo which is it it's really neat stuff and i i thought the the necklace angle that gives you kind of a telepathic or telekinetic link to gamera was certainly a a really nice touch and it's a through line that they they carry uh as these movies progress which is always i love callbacks like that and when they keep plot points throughout yeah, and I agree. And and to go back to the the flying part, it he kind of spins around like a top, and he was doing it initially. And I know we had talked about it before. I I was like, what in the fuck is going <laughs> on? Because like you're not expecting, you know, there's no indications that he can fly, and you're seeing these these uh, these pterodactyl dudes fly off the Gaios, and and he just kind of like like spins around and just like rockets off into space, and you're just like. <laughs> All right, I guess that's something he can do. Why not? He's a big turtle. Why can't he fly? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it is pretty cool. And, and I agree with you about the necklaces. The necklace is a nice kind of like through line through all three movies. And, and you know, we get to the third one as well. They've got the necklace for um, Iris as well. So it's it definitely kind of establishes a part of the lore that they do pretty well with through the entire trilogy. Yeah, I, I, and there's as a, to talk about this trilogy as a whole. It has a lot of things going for it. Um, the the human elements don't feel too overdone, and I think their use of practical effects throughout is really amazing. 
And then as CGI kind of progresses in this time period, they begin to use it more and more to greater effect. As far as a, a launching point, this is a very solid entry. And I truly, I would kind of challenge anyone watching this to have kind of a more solid and consistent trilogy in horror movies than this, because I really do think it continues to get better. And in horror movies, and, and we talked about this, usually there's a drop off in the second one or, or maybe even the third one. Uh, with this, that is not the case whatsoever, I don't think. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and, you know, it's hard because a lot of times with kaiju movies, they're really a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that could take them or leave them, and there's a lot of people that just out hate them. So it really kind of depends on what your, you know, preference and taste is. If you're down for that kind of movie, you know, along with your other horror taste, you know, all the other movies that you like, if you're down for the kaiju movies and you're okay watching what they are, you're okay watching a foreign movie. You're okay watching subtitles. You're done. Blah blah blah. If you're okay with all of that stuff, it is really hard to find a trilogy or set of movies that does get better as time goes on. Uh, especially having the initial one, like you said, being very solid. Um, a lot of times you have that first movie that's you know really amazing and great, but then it goes downhill after that. And this one actually does get better. You know, with each movie, and I do think the third is is the best of the three. Absolutely, and you had brought up two really good points that I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about um, on this one. And it's two of the really big themes for this, and one is kind of a very environmental focused one, and then the second one you brought up was kind of about Japanese national defense. And I thought they were both really brilliant points that you brought up. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't think we actually ended up talking a whole lot. The first recording about uh, the environmental lessons. Um, and it, but it is true, you know, all three do have kind of an environmental through line that goes through all three movies, which isn't uncommon for uh, kaiju movies or, or even Japanese movies for that matter. Um, you know, the original Godzilla, of course, was about uh, nuclear war and the things that the, the byproducts of those things that you can't see when they happen, but that Japan is still struggling with. You know, the original one being made in the 50s, you're talking about 10 years after, you know, we dropped nuclear weapons on Japan. So mm. you have a lot of those recent memories and a lot of those uh, commentaries that you don't find in a lot of societies, at least not so straightforward and not so. Uh, cutting or biting, you know, I mean, they, they were pretty, pretty intense uh, environmental and, and socio-political messages in the original Kaiju movies. But then, you know, with this one, um, you really kind of have to look, and really anytime you watch a Japanese movie, because the culture is so different from ours, um, you have to kind of look at Japanese history and Japanese lore and mythology and all those things. And, and really, after World War II, because of all the atrocities that Japan committed, they had to completely undo their military. So Japan, and I don't believe they even do to this day, have a standing military with which they can invade or go to war or anything like that. They just have the Japanese defense forces. So they talk a good bit about it in the movie, and they talk, it, it seems kind of pro-military expansion. Are you there, Rev? And, you know, as it stands now, I think even today, um, I think they still don't have a, a military that, you know, they can invade and, and those kind of things. I think it's more of just just their defense force. And, and that's something that, you know, I don't know if that was something that was intended to be a commentary in this movie, but it, it definitely serves to be one, um, you know, whether or not Japan should could should continue to have to be demilitarized. Uh, you know, whether or not they can have that force where they can go to war or whether they just have this small defense capability and whether that's enough if something actually were to happen like these giant monsters. 
And the, and uh, there was one line that I found really poignant that speaks to that that theme that you were talking about. And I think someone says, and this is just you know kind of paraphrasing, but they're like, "We should be the ones to handle this. We can't have the United States kind of handling all of our problems." <laughs> Oh yeah, that's that's true. I completely forgot about that. And that was a great line too, because it definitely does get that whole US as world police. Mm. I mean that that's commentary for sure. Let me ask you this. This is kind of a just very not very weakly connected, but it kind of talks to the a, a atrocities that you mentioned earlier have you and i have not seen this movie yet have you seen the movie i think it's called uh land of the rising sun or something to that effect it's about unit 731 yeah it's uh men behind the sun that was actually one of the first movies that i reviewed for the website um and and i'm a huge history buff so it was definitely something i was going to watch and the movie isn't that great but it really does, if you like history, and honestly, even if you don't, it's something everybody should know about, is the shit that they did in World War II makes Hitler look like, I mean, nothing. I mean, they did some truly, truly horrific things. And, uh, I mean, you know, as much as I'd like to feel bad that they don't have a military, they really shouldn't. They did some fucked up shit. <laughs> so, it's... You could read the Wikipedia and you probably don't need to watch Men Behind the Sun, but if you kind of want to see a visual representation, the movie was actually made uh, by China or people in China. Mm. Um, and they were the ones who suffered the worst of the atrocities under the Japanese in World War II. I, I, I have heard that that is, you know, one of the mo more disturbing movies. And yeah, China was definitely the target of a lot of war crimes on uh, Japan's behalf. And it's kind of, it's so crazy to see in cinema, their very kind of Western evolution of sorts, even in a movie like this, which I think is more easily for us to relate to. It is, you can see a lot of those kind of, cultural nuances of japan in this film well for sure and it, it's it's easier to see in movies like this um or it's easier to understand when you watch movies like this because it has so much of culture and mythology and you know religion and all of those things that would be completely foreign to us in america um you know like what we're going to talk about now a little bit with like the guardians of which was actually i believe it was the guardians of china but japan kind of has the same kind of things too um it's things that like we wouldn't know about unless we see them through stories or, or literature or anything like that um and it is you know we take for granted in america that everybody else kind of understands our culture because they've got so much of our media but Japan, I mean, even a, J a standard Japanese horror movie like The Ring, there are so many things that are scarier to them because of their culture that you may just not even understand in America. So the kaiju movies kind of help to bridge that gap and explain a lot of these differences in the way that they view things and, and in the way that their culture kind of focuses on those mythologies and ancestralism and things like that. Absolutely. Um in closing on this this first entry point to the trilogy, uh, I thought the final battle was awesome. Gamera, awesome. I really like the final battle and the use of miniatures. And I thought the suits looked really good. I gave this one three and a half stars. And, you know, just a little bit of a projection forward that the, the ratings – or as I rank them, I think they get better as it goes along. and But they're all very tight as far as how I have them. Uh, what, uh, if any, final thoughts would you like to add, Rev? Um, you know, I, I definitely recommend it. It's a fun movie. It's one you can show your kids, which, I mean, 
there's so many people that would love to introduce their kids to horror and doing it with Gamera or, or, you know, any of the Kaiju movies are great. This is a particularly good one that the kids will be entertained by. Um, and it does have, you know, a little bit of horror and a little bit of scary in it too. So you can kind of bridge that gap and, and kind of get them used to a little bit scarier before you dig into Gamera two, which is, which is scarier than the original. I uh, completely agree with you on that. Uh, would you like to do a a synopsis on Gamera to Attack of Legion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so essentially in Japan, there is a meteor that lands and uh, the military goes to investigate and nothing's there, but they end up finding that these creatures have kind of spread through the countryside um, because they're trying to colonize Earth and they're trying to steal uh, their nutrients from the glass. That's all. Uh, and Gamera kind of comes and, and tries to save the world. And it kind of involves Gamera and his relationship to um, the citizens and his attempts to try to save the country. Yeah. Um, one of the... You know, I guess it, it might be a, a couple themes, but I guess you could really boil it down to one. And, you know, environmentalism was obviously something they were super in tune with and, and really injecting a lot of uh, their philosophies and in, in how they felt in that Gamera, for lack of a better term, there you know, if there's Mother Earth and Gamera is kind of like the Japanese, even maybe even worldwide, but it's it is does seem very regionally linked to Japan, but almost like a naturalistic savior for them. Whereas Legion kind of seems to be um, an entity and a whole, you know, group of numerous insect like creatures that kind of uh feed off of what could be i mean it's electricity i think for the most part and radio waves but something that i think maybe at this time and maybe people still feel like could be negatively affecting the environment and also the kind of loss of these links that are introduced in the first one and that is all of the necklaces that had been connected to Gamera had broken so that is also kind of a major conflict that is more kind of metaphorically told in this one but it's all pretty interesting and I think all ties together pretty well yeah, I agree. And I think it's more about just the advancement of technology and how little that we actually care about what it may be doing to the environment more mm -hmm. than any specific advancement. Um, and as far as the necklaces, that's a good point. I didn't think about it. It's something that kind of leads us into the third movie as well of how in the first movie, you know, we've got that psychic link between the little girl and Gamera, um, which by breaking is showing Gamera's separation from the people that he's trying to save. So instead of just being this benevolent hero, you know, you start to wonder, uh, or the people are starting to wonder whether or not he's even on their side at all. Yes, definitely, because um, like you said, I believe her name is Asagi. Her necklace breaks, and, and I think they even allude to, and this might be at the end of this movie, that Gamera will do whatever it takes to protect the Earth, even if that means eventually having to attack humans to protect the Earth, which is you know probably a direction that it would be neat to explore and over and over again, these Kaiju movies kind of find new and in inventive ways to get that message across. And, you know, whether it be the monster's abilities or, you know, what is like, I, I think I saw a Godzilla movie where there was nuclear fission going on within the Godzilla and there was worry of like a meltdown. So it's always kind of commenting on, the advancements of technology and where that could take them. And I think it, it, it likens back to 
how you know the nuclear bomb affected them and that ripples all the way into the 90s well i mean you can't really blame them for being scared of nuclear technology i mean mm. you know they they were literally the the only people in the history of the world that have had to bear the brunt of it so you know, it's definitely, uh, it's understandable that they'd feel the way that they do, but they're not completely wrong. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of times where these advancements, while they're great for the humans that are living now, are not necessarily great for future humans. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, the number, one of the number one things that people around the world politically are talking about is, you know, global warming or, you know, environmental impacts of the things that we can do, you know, is it worth it knowing that we can cheaply and efficiently produce oil by fracking, knowing that you're also fucking up the groundwater and everything else. So it's, it's kind of the balance. And and I think that Japan is trying to deliver that, you know, sharp critique to those things in a way that may get across in way other ways, in a way that other ways won't. I I completely agree with you. And it's just, it's really interesting, especially with, you know, 25 years in the past, getting to look at this and understand just how monumental that was and and how it kind of gives you uh, an eye for these kinds of things and and even though the culture itself ha- it, it still is moving in that direction to have movies that are still inspired with that eye it, it's really neat and um it does make you wonder in america like what we have um i I don't know if you could say anything like 9 11 has has really influenced our our cinema too much but it's always really interesting to think of these monumental historical events and and how they are perpetually um inserted one way or another in this japanese cinema Oh, you know, and I actually hugely disagree as far as 9-11. It's actually one of the one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in in horror. Um, in fact, when I was in college, I actually had written a paper. I don't remember what class for, but I can't, I'm trying to think of what it was for because otherwise it almost doesn't seem appropriate. But <laughs> I wrote about uh, the rise of torture porn and how it was uh-huh. a response to 9-11. Um, I think we may have talked about that before a little bit. Um but it was, I think when you go through horror, horror is all subversive and horror is all response to culture. So for me, you know, when you have Night of the Living Dead, you know, as being an inadvertent, but yet a response and a really important response to racism and Jim Crow and all those things. And then, you know, you've got all of the black exploitation movies from the 70s about black people taking their power back. Um, you know, you've got all those movies in, you know, the nineties that were a response to consumerism. And I mean, even they live back in, I think late eighties, you know, and then finally when nine 11, nine 11 was so extreme and such a scarring sight for the American psyche, so to speak, that torture porn, I believe rose directly so that people could confront those fears and those extreme fears that are far worse than anything they're going to see on the television about the towers falling. And they could do it in a safe way, in a way that they're sitting in a theater and know that they are safe, even though there are horrible things happening on the screen. So to me, it really does everything, everything, every major, major political and social change immediately impacts the movies that are made around there, whether purposeful or not. And I think Japan, you just see, uh, you know, I hesitate to say they were hung up on the atomic bomb because again, it was kind of a big deal, but it definitely impacts things even, you know, 50, 60 years later. I'm so glad that you, you brought that up because I think you're dead right on that. I mean, hostile saw, a lot of the torture porn uh, movies were definitely directly involved with 9-11 and the war on terror. And, yeah. you know, seeing that, I mean, I don't know if, you know, gruesome photos or, or images 
were ever broadcast as as broadly as they were during that time and then even Guantanamo Bay and how we were torturing people in the war on terror I mean I definitely that was a an overlook on my part and I think it to put that into context does give a really good idea as to why this has something that has influenced it because I think we're going to see that ripple effect in our cinema probably for, you know, at least another decade as well, because I think uh, disturbing and gruesome horror is, is here to stay at least in certain subsets of cinema and horror. Well, and you know, I think conversely to that, I think it's also the reason why you're seeing movies like the conjuring and things like that. Those, which are essentially playoffs of the old haunted house and ghost movies um i think you're seeing that as a direct response to the rise in torture porn i think for a lot of people it just got to be too much Mm. but you know when you're talking about times when when there are gruesome scenes on television and everything like that it's actually um it reminds me and i know we're going to talk a bit more about the practical and and uh, cgi special effects here it reminds me of something tom savini said um you know, and Tom Savini, if, if you're watching this and not aware, is probably the greatest horror uh, makeup and special effects artist that ever existed. Um, he, he's amazing and my personal favorite. Um, but, you know, when he was doing Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead and all of those movies, they said, you know, how are you doing all of these things? How are you able to put these things into like real life things. And he said he was in Vietnam and he said, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just doing what I saw there. Um, and, and he said, you know, I saw these things and I saw these bodies, you know, that were turned inside out. So when I'm creating these things, when I'm creating these zombies or these zombie victims, I'm just creating what I saw in Vietnam. So I think, you know, you see a lot of that through the 70s as well, a lot of those reactions to the things that were shown on TV. And I, and I agree. I think that all of these things are, are a direct result of these things that we're watching elsewhere. You know, they're commentaries or inadvertent or, you know, advertent. I think a lot of times they're not really intentional. It's just kind of a, you know, because these filmmakers, they're going through this, the same things we are. They're seeing the same things we are. So, you know, whether they intend to use it as a commentary or not, you know, these are the things that they're subjected to while they're making the movies as well. Yeah. And, and you brought up numerous good points. Um, it, it's crazy to think that Savini, I, I did not know that he was a veteran. And, and I think that adds more acclaim to how uh, influential Vietnam was. If you look at it as, you know, something that movies are either done about, but now you can look at it as something that really helped progress horror as a whole. And then we get to like this movie that uses practical effects to probably its maximum effect. And I think there's a very good use of CGI in this as well. And, and despite the fact that it's only a year removed from its predecessor in the first one in the series, I think there was more CGI used and it was used very properly. But on top of that, the miniatures and the suits in this one were pretty damn good. Um, but the, the bad guy, there's one big baddie that is in a suit, but then we also have the kind of Legion aspect of it is made up of CGI and it was a good use of, you know, two very different things in CGI and practical. Yeah. And that's one of the things we had talked about on the first recording is that, you know, I don't mind CGI if it's not used like every chance you get, I'm okay with CGI as long as the things that can be done practically are done practically. And I think they did a really good job of balancing that in this film. Um, you know, you mentioned the Legion themselves, which are essentially like these like insect like creatures, um, that are flying us in a big swarm. There was that scene where, um, you know, Gamera's fighting the, the big bad guy and he gets swarmed by all of these bugs and, and they just coat him like, like a single layer all over his body. And it's incredible. It's an incredible use of, of both the practical and the CGI effects. Absolutely. And, and that was 
probably one of the most unsettling scenes. And it's also really cool too, because we see Gamera flying and kind of spinning, trying to get all these bugs off. And it, it seems like he's almost like a, a rolling buzzsaw, but he's like getting torn apart himself through this. Um, overall, I, I thought the action in this was really good. Uh, definitely on par with the first movie, if not a little better. But as you were saying at the end of the you know review for the first movie, the horror elements are cranked up a little bit in this one. And that is especially evident in the kind of opening subway scene that we get with that. And uh, would you want to go more into that kind of those horror-esque elements in the subway scene? Oh, for sure. The, the subway scene was masterfully done. Um, you know, after watching the first one, and, and it really is, I mean, it, it is at the end of the day, it's, it's a dude in a big giant turtle suit. Like you can't really set that aside, you know? I mean, it, it's silly. It's, it's kind of, you know, ridiculous. And, and as much as, you know, it may be culturally important or maybe whatever, it's still a dude in a turtle suit. So <laughs> you get to the second movie and you're like, okay, this is a dude in a turtle suit. Find a bunch of other guys. But then the first scene in the subway happens and you get like a jump scare and like blood splashing. And there's like, I don't, I don't know if you, I would call it intentional killing, but these creatures kill individual people and it's just, it's jarring and it's a completely different setup from the original, but it still does maintain a lot of the playfulness and a lot of the kind of absurdity and silliness of the original film. So you do get a lot more horror elements, but it's really more like a bridge film between a silly fun ones your kids would like and a little bit more of an introduction into horror. Yeah. Um, I, I gave this one a three and a half, but I, I would rank it, just slightly above the first one because I do feel like it it kind of takes that forward momentum and keeps pushing it forward and it's a great lead into the third one as well and uh, the the final scene kind of how Gamera takes all of this energy through the earth and then just sends it right at uh, the the big baddie of Legion while working with the Japanese defense force. It was a great ending to this one. And, and I thought it was a very solid film. Yeah, I agree. And it is better than the first one, uh, not by a whole lot. Um, so I think the, the three, five or whatever it was, you said, I, I think that's probably accurate. Um, it's not, an, it's not better enough to be rated higher, but it is better enough to be a slightly better movie than the first one. And it does kind of show that these are going to get progressively better as Tom goes on rolling into the third movie of this Gamera trilogy. We have revenge of Iris again by Shisuke Kanoko. This is 1999. So slightly more removed from the second one than the second from the first. And I think it, it, it is evident in the CGI and, and kind of, the the ambition of what they go through with this one. Uh, this film, we see a younger schoolgirl who was affected by the first movie. Uh, that battle in which a lot of you know her town and city was destroyed saw her parents killed, and in kind of a plot of revenge, she unleashes this new existential threat and names it iris after her her cat that also passed away and iris is unlike the other villains in many ways it has tentacles it looks really badass and it's it's largely comprised of cgi in a lot of the scenes and it gives gamera quite the run for its money and it has a very, it's a lot more scary, more horror elements for sure, and a very brutal battle at the end. What were your initial thoughts on this third movie of the trilogy? Yeah, you know, it, it is, it's a really good movie, um, first off. It's, it's fantastic, and it is wildly different from the first two. 
Um, it is a lot scarier. It makes everything, you know, it, it takes these creatures for what they are rather than just what they are on screen. So, you know, Gamera looks scarier, um, you know, and he's the hero, but he still looks scarier and he looks as terrifying as a giant monster would actually look if it was stomping throughout your city. Um, you know, this, the new bad guy is essentially like a mosquito vampire, uh, like octopus thing that just just fucks people and sucks them blood and everything else which which creates some amazing scary scenes uh, but it's also more than that and i know we had talked about this some on the previous recording it, it takes the of the look at the people that are affected by the mod um you know and that's something that you don't see a whole lot you know you watch a movie like the avengers or something and you see the avengers you know doing their battle city and oh the avengers save the world but they do like a hundred billion damage to the city and kill ten thousand people while they're at it you know this movie actually looks into that and says yeah he's a giant monster and he saved japan but he also stomped through a ton of like residential buildings and killed God knows how many people while he was doing it. So it takes a look at it from that perspective and the people that are actually impacted by his attempts to save the city, uh, which I thought was a really interesting look and, and kind of future thinking in the way that people would think about these movies. Yeah. And to see that come full circle and really drive the plot in this one is is really cool because the the main character has this justified hatred of Gamera and this hatred kind of fuels the evolution and growth of Iris, which in turn becomes the monster that has, you know, caused the type of destruction that is has made her hate Gamera in the first place. And her coming to this realization that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a classic kind of internal conflict that we see where we become the person that we hate most. And to have that, that story line and that plot unravel in this movie, I think was used to great effect and, and made this one a, a classic and a great way to end the trilogy. Absolutely. And it, it's like the old saying that's essentially goes, you know, revenge just makes there be two villains. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's the same way, you know, it, she, you're right, rightfully, you know, want revenge on Gamera, but she becomes the monster in her attempts to get it. So it's, it is definitely an interesting commentary and has less social commentary and more commentary on you, humanity, emotion, everything like that. You still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, sorry. You just you you cut out, but I I you said you know you become the the bad guy and 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 it's like I think the, a negative emotion like hate can can only kind of create a negative outcome and and it's it's illustrated in a really cool way uh, when we kind of see her almost through the eyes of Iris as being the perpetrators of the death of her parents, which, you know, you had said when we discussed this earlier, that it, it shows that the damage she is creating is, is essentially just as bad as what had happened, you know, and, and try in trying to get this revenge, she is giving this hurt that she had felt and passing it on to other people, which was a super cool way to kind of illustrate that, that plot point. Yeah. And essentially she, she has that vision. And, and for those who haven't seen the film, she basically has a vision where uh, she is, or Iris, which in this case is her, is the one that's killing her parents see it from kind of a first person point of view uh, which kind of further drives that point home and, and you're right the point i believe of that scene is to show that even though we know that gamera was the one that killed her parents she sees this essentially through the eyes of her monster 
as it's doing the same thing to other people. So it does kind of give her that like understanding that, yeah, Gamera did accidentally kill her parents, but she knows what she's doing and she knows she's in this guy and looking for revenge. And he's making just as many widows and orphans and everything else as Gamera ever did. Yeah. And another really cool kind of, uh, thing that they explored, which was specifically with Iris, how it evolves from kind of a cute, cuddly esque, you know, alien, as cute as aliens can be, uh, to this tentacle, blood sucking, leaving people as just, you know, shells of their former selves looking completely. Uh, devoid of a soul, uh, blood, anything. Those horror elements were awesome. And you had brought up a, a jump scare that happens with these kind of corpses in the movie, which is, it was really good. I was not expecting a jump scare in a, a, a Gamera movie, but they got me. And it leads into, you know, there's, there's personal destruction where it's uh, almost it's pretty much just murder, you know, like eye to eye essentially. And then we get massive destruction, which I think shows how quickly um, this evil can get out of hand. Oh, for sure. And, you know, with her being like a, a symbiotic relationship and, and, you know, having uh, at one point getting sucked into the creature itself, you know, she's basically like in the seat of the thing as well. Um, which, you know, again, there's a lot of, a lot of basis for that in these media with like mechs and things like that of people being, you know, in the driver's seat of these beasts. Um, but you know, yeah, I think that it really does, uh, kind of indicate how much she had given in to this revenge over everything else, you know, over her friends and her family. Cause at one point, you know, uh, Iris kills her like entire village, um, you know, and she doesn't really seem to care because all she's interested in is the revenge that he's going to take on Gamera. Yeah. Um, another huge element. And, and I don't know if I've said this yet, but this, this movie utilizes CGI probably the most. And I think to the greatest effect, obviously, the four years after the first movie and, and three after the second was definitely to its advantage in being able to use great CGI. But the my favorite part was the final battle and wish we have two suited kaijus fighting each other in an airplane hangar, cut to Gamera basically just blasting his own hand off to get the best of Iris this was cinematic gold. It was action the way I love action. And it was just full steam ahead, red line, great cinema. Did you feel the same way? I totally agree. The last scene, the last probably 15 to 20 minutes of the movie is absolutely stellar. And uh, it's, it's by far the best scene in this trilogy um it's one of the better if not the best scenes in a kaiju movie i've seen um you know you've got iris and and essentially is just beating the shit out of gamera and and stabs gamera's hand against the wall and gamera cuts his own hand off to be able to keep fighting and, and you know it's just it's indicative of you know the will of gamera's followers over iris's follower and when iris's follower eventually kind of uh, changes her mind and sees the error in his ways that helps to allow Gamera to kind of turn the tide in the battle. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the CGI and you're absolutely right. And, and for those who haven't seen this movie and want to kind of take a look and see what Iris looks like, you know, Iris, it, I mean, you needed CGI to be able to make Iris look the way that, the way that she looks um, because it's not a creature that you could really create it practically. Um, which I think does, you know, make it acceptable. Yeah. And you touched on something uh, really neat, I think. And I think it goes really deep into Japanese culture. I, I believe fighting culture, or kind of a warrior spirit is deeply embedded within the culture. 
We also get to touch on Japanese mythology as Iris and Gamera are kind of parts of Japanese mythology that, that goes all the way back to, you know, astronomers making these shapes out of the sky in which they thought they had protectors for, for each kind of direction, north, south, east, and west. It was all, they added so many elements to this one. They added a lot of cool characters too, or they at least brought back cool characters and then added cool characters. And the CGI was just the cherry on top, I think, because uh, the picture I have up doesn't do justice to the CGI because this is a picture of the suit. But the tentacles and kind of the movement patterns of Iris is so unique. You're you're right. I don't think it could have been uh, well done throughout the whole movie without it. Well, and, you know, you had brought up in our previous reporting, too, and it was actually really interesting because I did a little bit of research after kind of in between our recordings. You had brought up how um, it kind of felt Pokemon-y, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were kind of references to Pokemon. I don't know if you have access to the internet there, but it may be worth taking a look to see what I'm talking about. Um, there's one called Cresselia. It's, uh, I don't have, you know, I don't know enough about Pokemon to tell you when it came from, but I had kind of looked and, and this one is a pretty good representation of Iris um, and what it looks like. Um, and I don't know if that's based on some kind of Japanese lore, as a lot of the Pokemon are, but it is very similar in appearance to, to what Iris looks like, especially near the end. Um, so there is so much of the Japanese folklore and so much of the Japanese uh, mythology that comes into this. Um, you know, it, it just it's really interesting from a different cultural perspective, especially if you have any, if you have any appreciation of Japanese culture in general. There was a, another Pokemon too, and I'm I'm pulling it up. I don't know if you want to look. It the first one that came to mind when I saw it was a Pokemon named uh, Deoxys. But I definitely I pulled up Cresselia, and I can totally see that too. Um, I do think, and I and I think those Pokemon came out after the fact, so I would not be. You know, I, I'm definitely not out of line in saying I think this Pokemon was was those Pokemon were influenced by this uh, creature, which is kind of cool to think about. You know how things get get influenced and whatnot. But um, we we touched on the final battle, which I thought was amazing, and I think uh, one last point would be kind of the cult-esque guy, human, that is introduced in this one, which is probably one of the more entertaining and charismatic and interesting characters they've thrown into these movies thus far. I agree. And he really is. He's kind of like this like weird death cult type guy near the end of the movie, kind of revealing that kind of he's pulling for Iris to destroy the world, um, which is, you know, not a great plan, but <laughs> I, he's really a fascinating character and they don't really like he's in most of the movie, but they don't really dig into his motivations or anything like that. And you had said before, and I agree, like you could have a standalone movie with this guy where like, you know, it's, him and his cult of whoever the fuck feels this way versus Gamera, they're creepy. And he did a really good job of just being like this eccentric, weird, creepy death cult type guy, which doesn't seem like it would have a place, but it was pretty, pretty scary and, and was a pretty good addition to the movie. Yeah. Um, I gave this one four out of five stars. I, I do think it trumps slightly the, the first two movies in this series, it was it was definitely a great way to end the trilogy. Uh, Rev, do you have any final thoughts on this movie and the trilogy as a whole? You know, I agree with you on your four. Um, I may would even go a little bit higher than that. I actually, you know, in reflection, I did think it was a good bit better than the other two. And I thought the other two were already pretty good. I just thought this one, there were some truly incredible scenes in this one that kind of blew my mind. And it was not at all what I was expecting after watching the first two. Um, it, it is wildly different and extremely 
uh, extremely much more along the horror bent than the other two. Um, and I, I mean, I, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would also like to point out too, in Iris and Gamera Iris, um, there's also a little bit of a humor aspect as well. Um, you know, there was a scene near the end where this guy who had, his family was basically the guardians of the location where Iris was like buried or whatever. I, I don't interned anyway. Um, he had this like dagger, this legendary dagger that was supposed to allow him to defeat him right at the end of the movie, right when they're having this giant battle in the air, airport hangar, he kind of like stands back and says, I hope this works. And like, throws the dagger at, at Iris kind of bounces off the chest and falls to the ground and you're like well all right guess that didn't work <laughs> and he ends up just kind of getting his ass whooped and then uh they have to do CPR on on one of the people at the end of it and they're pressing down on her belly which is not how you do CPR <laughs> Um, and it's just, it was just kind of a, a fun little, the ending kind of added a little bit of humor in there that, that a lot of movies don't really dare to make. And I thought it went pretty well. Yeah. Um, you know, for this series as a whole, I would say it, it could be appreciated without watching any kaiju movies before it, um, you could probably watch any of the three without any of the knowledge, but I think they're all solid enough that it's, it's, you might as well watch the trilogy, especially I do th I, the third one. You would definitely benefit from watching the first one, but I wouldn't say it's absolutely necessary viewing or, or mandatory viewing is the term I was looking for. But, um, great for if you're if you have a younger audience with you that you want to expose to horror movies this would be the route to go as you said and it has i think the perfect mixture of action horror fantasy uh mythology and practical effects with cgi yeah and while there is a lot about Japanese culture that's in the movie and a lot of things that you're probably not going to completely understand or relate to because it is such a different and, and some people would say coming from an American perspective, bizarre culture. Um, it is, this is one of the few Japanese movies that you don't really have to be super versed in it because what you need to know, they explain. And even if you don't understand what they explain, it doesn't really matter. It's still ultimately a giant turtle monster that's defending Japan against these other monsters that are trying to fight Japan. And that's really all you need to know. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a fun monster movie, super fast paced, um, generally entertaining. And it doesn't have any of those weird lolly draggy parts. Like a lot of times Japanese movies tend to have. Um, it's pretty straightforward from beginning to end. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's for, I guess one last topic to go over. Um, and we, we kind of talked about this, but I think the fans would be interested to know. Um, how do you think the, the, the prevalence of CGI is going to affect horror? Uh, do you see that kind of being a mainstay, kind of the way that it is in action movies, maybe more specifically monster movies? You know, it's a good question um, because I do think that people do tend to rely on CGI more than they should. I also have noticed um, watching it because I, my website specifically focuses on a lot of indie horror. And I think that CGI is a lot cheaper to do than it used to be. Mm. Um, you know, like you've got iPhone apps that can, that can edit CGI into videos now, explosions and, you know, things like that. So I have noticed in some of the cheaper CGI are cheaper indie films that there's been more CGI um, added to them because they can. I mean, you know, it used to be you'd have to spend $10 million on a five second CGI scene and you can do it now on your iPhone. So I definitely think that a lot of times it will be more prevalent, but I also think it's important to remember that horror is written, directed, acted by horror fans and horror fans love practical effects. Mm. So I think that there will always be more prevalent CGI because it's a thing that exists and it's getting cheaper, but I think there will be plenty of practical effects in 
you know, multi multitudes of movies uh, that come out just because of the genre's love of practical effects. Yeah. Um, I, I'm glad I got to watch this trilogy with you and talk it over. Uh, fingers crossed this recording sticks. And if you're hearing this, that's a good sign. Uh, Horror Rev. Dude, better right <laughs> doing this again. <laughs> Horror Rev is our horror resident expert. Um, I'm so glad to have you. And guys, if you like the episode, he writes daily reviews on thehorrorrevolution.com. And he's got top 10 lists. He's got reviews. He's got interviews with directors and uh, cinematography. Um, what are they called? The people who do the cinematography? I know director. Cinematographer. Cinematographers. There we go. <laughs> A lot of stuff to check out. Uh, yeah, man, I, I appreciate it. And we do try to update all the time. There's a ton of great movies. Uh, you know, I try to do a lot of movies you've heard of. And honestly, a lot of movies you don't uh, or you haven't. Um, I love indie directors. Um, I get to talk with them all the time on Twitter. It's one of the most rewarding parts of my job is getting to see movies that I otherwise wouldn't have. And uh, being able to share some of those things with you guys because it's you know, it's why they do it. Um, I don't think there's very many horror movie fans out there that haven't dreamed of, you know, making their own movie. And these guys are out there doing it. And, and I'd love nothing more than to support them through all of it. So if you like horror in general, check out the site. There's a tons of great, th great things to see. I'd love to hear from anybody that has any suggestions for things they'd like to see. And if you want new recommendations for shit you otherwise would not have come across, check it out because we got a little bit of everything on there. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and thank you, the fans, for joining us. Uh, the pleasure is always ours. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and check out the Horror Rev's website. This has been great. Thank you very much, Rev. I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you for having me, sir.